Hi there. I want to be real with you. Um, I get a little pessimistic in my talk. <laughs> but I'm an optimist at heart. I'm really excited about what Air, um, Acre and Elroy are doing. So hang in there. The talk does end on a positive note. Um, before I get all dark on you, uh, I want to start with a little anecdote from my freshman year of college. My sculpture professor asked us to come to the first day of class with something ugly and something beautiful. I came in with two photos. And if I can figure out my remote, the first photo may, may switch technologies on you here. Speaking of the pessimism, The first photo was this Pontiac Aztec. <laughs> the second photo was a Bentley Le Mans race car. Seeing as I'm an engineer and a car nerd and a racer, I'm guessing that you know which one I thought was ugly and which one I thought was beautiful. My professor actually disagreed with me. The race car was too much of a machine for her. It was somewhat unnerving and scary. And she found some attributes of the Pontiac actually pretty positive. At the time, there was only one lesson that I took away. That she was wrong, but that's OK, because it's not self-evident that the beauty in the race car is all about how every single feature is optimized for perfect performance on the racetrack. Because I was an arrogant college freshman, it of course did not occur to me that I might be the one who's wrong. Fortunately for all of us here tonight, it's not college Ryan that you're listening to. And since then, I think I've become a little bit less judgmental about things, and I'm confident that I've learned a lot and gained a lot of experience. It started with turbine blades for aircraft engines at GE. Then I designed and built high-end custom furniture. And mostly, I've designed and developed consumer products and experiences with physical and digital interfaces. So that's enough about me. My name's Ryan Wickery. I do product development at Frog. Product development is our phrase for the combined practice of industrial design plus engineering. And so now that we've gotten to know each other a little bit, there's something that I need to get off my chest. You've probably heard a lot, I've certainly heard a lot, that hardware is hard. And I have to disagree with that, maybe less judgmentally than back in college. But I think hardware is easier to make now than it ever has been. We have amazing tools for design and development. And you can go on Alibaba, find a few contract manufacturers, send them your 3D files, and a few months later, you'll get CAD back. In case you don't believe me on this, <laughs> I'm just going to throw up a few, few things. You probably had a half dozen of your Facebook friends invite you to uh, contribute to their Kickstarter campaign. And a few of them probably succeeded in raising money. And uh, all of these interesting people actually shipped the product after successfully raising money. <laughs> so I hope I've made my point that hardware nowadays may be still hard. Certainly, quality is still an open question, which is a topic for a separate talk. Um, but there's something I've been hearing recently that's causing me some concern. Uh, when I talk to the VCs that fund a lot of my startup clients, they tell me they don't want to invest in hardware anymore, or at least not in consumer electronic hardware. They've been scared away by some prominent recent failures of hardware companies. And so I've had to ask myself the question, are we failing at hardware? That's the we here in Silicon Valley, uh, the we of designers, the we of design consulting, corporate America. I think everyone in this audience should be asking themselves that question. And so I went out uh, and made sure that I understood all of the case studies And 
And so, again, I think I've made my point here. I do want to clarify, I think all of these are great pieces of hardware. There was tons of work done on user experience, on engineering, and on manufacturing, and all of these are really solid pieces of hardware, but they failed anyway. So that leads us to the next question, which is if we are failing at hardware, why are we failing at hardware? To answer that, I want to go back to that freshman sculpture class. When I see both of these cars now, I see them a little bit differently. First of all, I don't find either one particularly beautiful or particularly ugly. But when I look at the Pontiac now, based on all of my clients that I've worked with and experience doing product development over the years, I see a product development process that was driven by marketing. Someone put together a big list of everything they wanted in the brochure, and then they went out and they got the teams to put every single thing in this car. When I look at that Bentley, I see an engineering-driven product development process. Someone in the engineering team put together the performance specifications list, and then that team engineered the fuck out of those performance specifications. <laughs> More importantly, though, I see very linear product development processes for both of these. For the Pontiac, you started with that marketing brochure wet dream, and then you moved linearly through a bunch of other departments until you did some engineering and then moved to manufacturing. I think the process was probably a little different for the Bentley. I wouldn't necessarily say my waterfall diagram here is perfectly accurate, but uh, what I want to highlight is that that magenta circle with the engineering is the hero department, and otherwise this process flowed through in a linear fashion. At the end, the marketing team sold some advertising space and splashed some decals on the car. But that sort of linear product development process doesn't work anymore. Times have changed. All of our hardware products now are actually multimodal user experiences. Consumers expect that they're going to have a seamless experience across multiple digital and physical touch points. They may even, certainly, I go home and I have a Nest system in my home. I expect to be able to do part of my interaction with my Nest on my phone as I'm also opening the garage with my app and then finish the job on the little puck that lives on my kitchen counter. We also have way higher expectations for quality and for a bespoke brand experience that matches my lifestyle expectations. So we can't do this single team product development anymore. Instead, we have to have every department in our company work together, delivering their output at the same time to deliver a high-end product experience. And if that product experience isn't perfect, your company may go the way of Juicero or Pebble. And so what we need to do is try to erase the boundaries between the different departments at our companies or the different team members at our companies. We need to turn all of these boundaries into active membranes, pushing ideas back and forth between every single department all at the same time so that we can get to that final product experience. We talked about hardware not being hard. I still think that's true, but doing this is definitely hard. So we're moving out of the dark now into the, uh, into the positive. What can we do about it? How can we succeed at hardware? I'm going to give you a few of my own ideas. A uh, caveat that um, this is Ryan Wickery speaking. Take them as you will. Um, first, the software UX industry has developed really great processes and methodologies for creating good user experiences. We should use them on hardware. And actually, most of you probably know those UX methodologies came from hardware. They came from Don Norman. They came from the founding times of IDEO and Frog. They just got adapted far more successfully by the software industry, and we in the hardware industry have let them go to some extent. We need to own those and bring them back. Two, we can assign a product experience owner. 
whenever we're deciding to build a new product, there should be a single person that everyone in the company can go to who has ownership over that product. They shouldn't report to the head of a single department like engineering or marketing. They should actually be above all of those team members, and those team members report to this product experience owner. For the duration of product development, we must hold regular stand-ups involving the leaders of every team who have an impact on or are impacted by the product. You saw my nice diagram. Uh, a lot of my coworkers have a metaphor for this. They talk about um, replacing the wheel when you get a flat on your vehicle. When you start tightening those lug nuts down, you don't go in a circle one after the other, tightening them all the way to full torque spec and then moving on to the next. You very much, that will result in a wheel that's imbalanced. We need to crisscross uh, in a star pattern, skipping from one lug nut across to the far side and tightening just a little bit at a time. It's very similar for product development and talking about uh, this multidisciplinary work to deliver a cohesive product experience. So what we can do to achieve that is hold weekly or monthly stand-ups where the leaders of every team are there. It must be easy for everybody to access and influence the product requirements. What we see from our more traditional clients is a 100-page Word document or a multi-tab Excel sheet that contains all of the product specifications and requirements. And it's very confusing except for the owner of that document. And it's very hard to navigate to page 74, section 17B, in order to find the requirement that you're looking for and suggest a change. We need a way for the, our teams to collaborate and be able to influence those product requirements easily. Finally, we can all be the membrane reach beyond our core skills, gain understanding and empathy for the work of those in other departments, and then collaborate across disciplines. So that's it for me. I encourage you all to go out there and be the membrane. Let's succeed in hardware. <laughs>